Okay guys, today we're going to have quite a couple of items on our agenda. The first thing we're going to talk about is that tricky question at the end of the last assignment that we were doing in class. Then we're going to talk about how to define and name angles. We're also going to talk about measuring angles and we're going to talk about a couple of more things after that. One of the words that we're going to cover today is going to be the word angle. Another word we're going to cover today is going to be a new word for us, and that's the word vertex. Another word for us today is also going to be the word sides. Okay. But before we get into all of these new words, let's go over that tricky question that we had last class that some of us had a little bit of difficulty with. Now let me say this. Some of you guys came pretty close to answering that question. You just left out a couple of little things. Well, first, the question says, draw and mark a figure in which M is the midpoint of segment ST. Let's do that first, because I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. Okay, so I am going to draw my segment ST. and I'm going to label it. There is an S, there is a T. Let me just move that up a little bit here. Okay, bring a little higher up here so we can all see it. Now, it says that M is the midpoint, so naturally, we would put M where we think the middle is, and that's okay. I'm going to put it right here, and I'm going to put a little M right there. Now, the trick to this is, how do we know that M is, in fact, the middle? Just putting it there where I think it's close to the middle is not enough. I have to do a little bit more than that. In geometry, I need to be a little bit more specific. So, how do I mark that M is the midpoint? Well, if you remember, we said that the midpoint bisects a segment. So how do I show that it bisects it? Well, that's pretty easy. All I have to do is just put a congruency mark here and a congruency mark there. That lets me know that M is the same distance from S as it is from T on segment ST. We've done that so far. Next, it tells us that segment SP is equal to, excuse me, not segment SP because there's no bar, up, there's no symbol up there. They just tell us that SP is equal to PT, meaning that they have the same, they're about the same size. Well, if you notice, S and T have a common point, which is P. And most of us would naturally think that it's gonna be on this line here, but that's not true. Let me show you how. If I just take a line from here to there, and one from here to there, well now, S and T have something in common, point P. And we're going to draw that this way. Now remember, it says that they're equal. Well, how do I say that they're equal? How can I show that SP is equal to PT? That's easy. I use a congruency mark. Except, I'm not going to use a congruency mark with just one dash. I'm going to use a congruency mark with two dashes. If I put a one dash here, what I will be saying is that SP would be equal to the distance to, to SM. And nowhere in the question does it state that. All it says is that SP is equal to PT. This is very distinct or unique from this. So I have to use different congruency marks. Next it says, that T is the midpoint of segment PQ. Remember that the midpoint bisects something, meaning it cuts it into two congruent parts. The way that M divided segment ST into two equal parts, T is doing the same thing. Well, if T is the midpoint somewhere in the middle, well, that means that the other side has to be the same as this side here. And I'm going to show you what that looks like now. Do my best to get it straight. There we go. And 
and we can call this Q. But I'm still not done, because remember, T is the midpoint. Well, if T is the midpoint, it's the same distance from P as it is from Q. How do I show that? By using congruency marks. Well, I know that from here to here, it's two congruency dashes. Well, from here to here, it's also going to be two congruency dashes. And I hope that that answers your question on question number 20. Let's move on to the vocabulary words for today. The first word that we're going to talk about is going to be an angle, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? And the definition of an angle is the following. An angle is formed by two rays that share a common endpoint. An angle is formed by two rays that share a common endpoint. Well, let's look at two rays. Here's one ray, and here's another ray. And I'm going to call this ray, ray B, B, A, and I'm going to call this ray, ray B, C. If I wanted to denote the name, I'd have the little arrow like this right here, and it would be ray B, A, and this one down here would be denoted as ray B, C. Notice that the first letter in each of these is B, indicating that the endpoint is what is B. Well, I can just take my second ray and bring it together here because the endpoint, this endpoint is B and this endpoint is B, they're the same endpoint. I'm going to bring them together. And now, what I've just created is an angle. I have my two rays sharing a common endpoint. The endpoint for ray BA is B, and the endpoint for ray BC is B. They both have the same common endpoint. I bring them together, and I just created an angle. Now, let's talk about naming this angle. Let's talk about naming this angle. This angle has three names. But before we get to that, let me include one more point that I almost forgot to include. Notice how these two rays have a common endpoint. Well, that common endpoint has a name. And the name of that endpoint is called a vertex. So an angle is formed by two rays that share a common endpoint. And that common endpoint between the two rays is called a vertex. Well, this angle has three names. Angles can be named in the order of the letters of the angle, or they can be named by the vertex. And just like a, lay, a line, array, or a segment have a special symbol, an angle also has a special symbol. So this can be called, here's my special symbol, angle A. B, C, because it's going in order, A, B, C. It can also be called angle C, B, A, C, B, A, or I could just call it angle B. Now, something important to notice in the name of angles. Notice that the vertex is always in the center of the name. Notice that the vertex is always in the center of the name angle A, B, C, angle C, B, A, and I can just use the vertex to name an angle, angle B. Now there's a special rule that you use when you want to use just the vertex to name an angle. Let me show you what I mean by that.
let's suppose, for example, that I have another ray. And let's call this ray, ray B, D. Let's call it ray B, D. So now I can include my ray because it's a common endpoint. I can bring it over here. We know that's endpoint is B. And this would be D. Could I still call this angle angle B? Could I just call it angle B? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is no. Why, you ask? Well, let's take a look. Notice that when I don't have this ray here, my vertex is just with these two rays. So I could clearly see that B is the vertex of A, B, C, or C, B, A. There's no question about it. But the minute I include another ray here, could I call it angle B? The answer is no, because I don't know which vertex is referring to. We just created a new set of angles. Let's take a look right here what I'm talking about. We just created another new angle right here. Where the name of that this angle can be angle D B A going this way D B A or I can call it angle A B D A B D but I can't call it angle B anymore I can't because the endpoint or the vertex is being shared by two sets of different angles the only time that we can use one letter for the vertex to name an angle is when that vertex is not being shared with any other angle. So if that's not there, whoops, not that. If I remove that, well now I have angle ABC or angle CBA. It's clear that B is the vertex. But once I include this ray here, I'm not sure which vertex I'm referring to. Is it the angle here or the angle there? Let's take a look at some more examples. Whoops, going the wrong way. Let's take a look at this image here on the right first. If you're wondering how many angles are in this picture, the answer is three. There are three angles. The first angle is here. And we can name that two ways. Let's call that angle V, excuse me, X, A, Y, angle X, A, Y, or I can call it angle Y, A, X, Y, A, X. Can I call it angle A? Can I call it angle A? The answer is no, I cannot, because A, the vertex, is being shared with another angle. Well, Let's see what that other angle is. That other angle is right here. Coming down and going out that way. Well, what would I name this angle? Well, again, this angle has two names. I can call this angle YAZ. YAZ. Or I can call it angle ZAY. ZAY. Can I call it angle A? The answer is no, because the vertex for this angle, for this set of angles, is being shared with this angle here. So the answer is no. So these are the only possible names that I have for these angles here. No, I'm sorry. There's another set of angles which I failed to mention. Let's see if I can erase this here. Because we did say that there were three angles here. If you notice, there's another set of angles right here. And we can call that angle X, A, Z. Or we can call it angle Z, A, X. But can we call it angle A? No, we cannot. Because A is being shared by the other two angles. So in total here, we have three angles. We have one here on the left, one on the right, and one in the bottom here. So we have three sets of angles. And any time that we're sharing the vertex, we cannot use just angle A to denote that. We can't do that. 
Well, let's take a look at the other picture on the left hand side and see if we can define some of these angles. The first angle that comes to my attention would be this angle right here. Okay? And how would we name that angle? Well, I would name it angle RUV, RUV, or I would name it angle VUR. Can I call it angle U? U is the vertex. Can I call it just angle U? The answer is no. I cannot call it angle U, and we're going to see in a second why that is. Let's look at another angle. Angle that comes to my attention is this one right from here to there to there. And how would I name this angle? Well, I would call it angle VUT, VUT, or we can call it angle TUV, TUV. Again, notice that both these sets have the same vertex. They're sharing the same vertex. So can I call it just angle U? The answer is no. That's why not, because this vertex is being shared by these two angles. Let's look at some more angles. Let's look at this angle right here. How would I name that angle? Well, I would name it angle UTV, UTV, or I can call it angle VTU. V, T, U. Could I call it just angle T? Can I call it just angle T? And the answer is yes. Because if you notice, my vertex is not being shared with any other two rays. Are there any other angles here that we missed? I think there's another set of angles which we missed completely. Let's take a look at this one here and this one there. How would I name this, this set of angles, or this angle, excuse me. How would I name this angle? Well, this angle here would be named angle UVT, UVT. I can also call it angle TVU, TVU. My vertex is V. Could I call this angle just angle V? Can I call it just angle V? And the answer is yes, because my vertex is not being shared as a vertex with any other angle. It's not being shared by as a vertex with any other angle. And we're going to get some more practice with this later on today in our classroom assignment. Now, let's talk about measuring an angle. Let's talk about measuring an angle. Okay, let's talk about measures of an angle. Okay, what is the definition? What is the definition of a measure of an angle? Well, the measure of an angle is the smallest amount of rotation around the vertex from one ray to another ray. The smallest amount of rotation around the vertex from one ray to another measured in degrees. Measured in degrees. And I should probably include the D here. Might have forgotten to include a D there should be measured in degrees. There should be a D right there. Let me add that in. Measured in degrees. So let's look at an example of how we measure an angle. What is the angle measure? Let's say I take an angle here this way and I label this angle angle A, B, C. It's called angle A, B, C. And I want to measure the angle. When, when I'm measuring the angle, I'm measuring the distance from one ray to the other ray in the shortest distance. So I'd be measuring from here to here. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking how far it is from here to here in degrees. So for that, I'm going to grab my protractor. 
Now I'm going to guess that it jumped. Yep, there it is. Let me grab my protractor. Let me bring it down. Bring it right here. Okay. And we're going to get some practice with this today as well. So don't worry about it. Make that a little bit bigger. And rotate my. Now, the thing about when you want to measure an angle, you want to make sure that the center of your protractor goes over your vertex. The center of the protractor goes over your vertex. So I'm going to bring it right over my vertex there. And you'd probably be holding it this way. And you see how I have zero here? I'm going to line that up. I'm going to line it up with my base. And now I'm going to measure from this ray to that ray. And if you notice here, don't worry about these numbers. I'm going to talk about it in a second. Let's start here at zero. And I'm going to bring it up, starting from zero. I'm going to focus your attention, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to focus your attention right here along these sets of numbers. Let's focus our attention right here in the center, right? Well, it's going to go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, mm, about almost 90, about 89 degrees. So this angle measures about 89 degrees, okay? It measures 89 degrees. Okay, but now that we've talked about that, we need to talk about another part of the measure. And that's going to be called the reflex measure. Let's talk about the reflex measure. The reflex measure is the largest amount of rotation. Now, this is just something that's good to know. Do we generally use it? Not a lot, but you need to know it's there. And so, whoops, made that probably a little bit too big. Made that a little bit too big. There we go. You know what? Let's just bring that out of the way. If the measure from here to here is, let's just say, 90 degrees, the measure from here to here, let's say it's 90 degrees, well, the reflex measure is the rest of it. And what shape does that make? That makes a circle. So how many degrees are in a circle? How many degrees in a circle? Well, if you guess 360 degrees, you are correct. Well, if we took up 90s from here to here, what would be the reflex measure? How, much, how many degrees are left over here? Well, it simply would be 360 minus 90 would give us 270 degrees. So the reflex measure, or the largest measure around these two rays, would be 270 degrees. That would be the reflex measure. Now, there's something about the compass, excuse me, about the protractor that I would like to talk about. Let's take a look at Mr. C's protractor. Here's Mr. C's protractor. I'm going to make that a lot bigger so that everyone can see that. Make it a lot bigger so everyone can see it. Notice that my numbers start at zero and they go all the way to 180 because angles are between zero and 180 degrees if we look at the definition. The smallest amount of rotation around the vertex from one ray to another measured in degrees from zero to 180. So here I got my protractor, it goes from 0 to 180. So if I wanted to throw in an angle in here, let me just throw an angle in here. Okay, I'm going to line it up with my, uh, my I'm going to line up my vertex with the center of my protractor. See what I did there? And then I'm going to put it up right here this way. So I have a 90 degree angle have a 90 degree angle, 90 degree angle, and if I wanted to, well, I can't rotate it, but if I, if, you know, if I wanted to measure the distance, I can use the numbers from zero all the way 
to 90 degrees. So I just happen to have made a 90 degree angle here. Okay. Now, here's the part that confuses a lot of my students. Let me get rid of that angle. Let me get rid of that angle. Here's the part that confuses a lot of my students. You're looking at, you might be looking at a protractor right now, and it might look a little more confusing, but let's clear that up. Here my numbers go from 0 all the way to 180, and we saw how we measured that. Well, if I just erase these right here, what does that say? 0, 10, 20, 30, and it goes all the way to what? To 180. Well, why do you have two sets of numbers? Well, that's because your angles aren't always facing one way. Sometimes your angles might be facing the other way. And you might want to make it a little bit easier on yourself. This, now it's going this way. Oh, well, where's here? Look at this angle. This angle is facing in this direction now. Right? This angle is facing in this direction. So if I wanted to measure this angle right here, let's label it. Let's label it. Let's label this angle uh, A, B is the vertex. Oops, sorry, C is over there. And let's uh, A, B, let's call this D, right? If I wanted to measure the measure of angle A, B, C, well, I want to measure from here to here. Well, what makes it easier for me, going counting from 180 to 110, or can I just go from 0 to, to 70? Yeah, I can just go this way. That's so much easier. And instead of subtracting from 180 or doing some extra math, well, what about if I wanted to measure angle ABD? What if I wanted to measure angle ABD or angle DBA? Well, instead of going from 70 to 180, wait a minute, here's 0 all the way to what? To 110. So it's just a matter of convenience. Don't let the numbers fool you. You want to just, if your angle's on the left-hand side, go from 0 to here. If you're measuring this angle, and if your angle the, happens to be on the right-hand side, we'll just use the inside numbers. That's all it is. That's all it is. Nothing to be confused about. Okay? And the last bit before we get to work today, let's talk about congruency. Let's talk a little bit about congruency. What are congruent angles? Well, congruent angles are angles that have an equal measure. Congruent angles are angles that have an equal measure. Okay. Let's take a look at some examples. Let's say here, for example, that I have angle ABC. And on the other end, I have angle DEF. And I want to show that angles ABC and angles DEF are congruent. Now, by the way, just a quick question. Could I name this angle here just angle B? And could I name this angle here just angle E? If you guess yes, you guess correctly. Because notice that my vertex, the vertex of these angles, aren't being shared with any other angles. But let's talk about congruency. Let's talk about congruency. Let's say I wanted to show that these two angles are congruent. Well, do you remember those little congruency dashes that we had for the segments? Well, we have something very similar to that for the angles, and they look like this. I would put a little arc right here with a little dash, and a little arc right here, and a little dash, indicating that this angle and this angle, the distance between the two rays, are congruent with these little dashes here. That is what they mean, that they are congruent. Let's talk about another term which might also sound somewhat familiar. Let's talk about an angle bisector. Before we talked about a midpoint being a bisector. Now we're talking about an angle bisector. Well, if a midpoint is just a point that's equally distant from two endpoints, well then an angle bisector is a ray that divides the angles into two congruent angles. So let's do that. An angle bisector is a ray that divides the two angles, there should be an S there, into two congruent angles. 
So let's construct an angle bisector. Okay. Here's one ray. Here's another ray. I have an angle. And let's say there is my bisector. And then we label this angle. Let's call this A, B, C, and D. By the way, can how many angles do I have in this picture? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? If you guess three, the answer is correct. You have three angles here. You have angle ABC, you have angle CBD, and you have angle ABD. Now here's the million dollar question for the day. Can you name this angle B? Is angle B an appropriate name for this angle? And the answer is no, it is not. Because B, the vertex, is being shared with all three of the angles that are here. But let's get back to talking about an angle bisector. This is A, this is B. Let's say, for example, that I wanted to display that angle ABC. Let me highlight it here. Angle A, B, C. It is right here, right? Angle ABC is congruent to angle C, B, D. This angle there. How would I do that? How would I show that they're congruent? Well, the way that I would do that is by putting a little arc here and a dash, an arc there and a dash. And if you notice, what's ray BC doing? Ray BC is dividing these two angles into congruent angles, into two congruent angles. And that is what an angle bisector looks like. You know it's the angle bisector because it's dividing these two angles into two congruent angles. The same way that a midpoint bisects a segment into two congruent segments. Okay? So that is what an angle bisector looks like. And this is also how we show congruency between angles. Okay? That being said, guys, today we are going to work in our textbook on pages, page 42. We are going to do numbers 1 through 5. We're going to do numbers 7 through 14. We're going to do numbers 15 through 20 and number 21. Okay, guys, let's get to work.